morning and welcome to the 28th meeting uh, in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone, as I normally do at this point, to switch off mobile phones um, as they can sometimes interfere with the sound system. Of course, in saying that, you will notice that uh, some officials and indeed members are using tablets um, instead of hard copies of papers. Our first item uh, on the agenda today is a decision on whether to take items three and four in private. Item three is consideration of the evidence that we have received on the DAF budget to inform the committee's report. <coughs> and item four is the committee's revised approach to the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill. Um, can I have the committee's agreement to take these items in private? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that is agreed. Um, and we, we now move uh, to item number two and begin our second session uh, of annual scrutiny of the Scottish Government staff budget for the coming year 2015-2016. And can I welcome this morning, uh, it seems quite a wee while, Cabinet Secretary, but we, uh, um, a warm welcome to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, uh, who joins us this morning, along with uh, Christine McLaughlin, uh, Deputy Director of Finance, Health and Wellbeing uh, from the Scottish Government. Welcome to you both. Um, I give the Cabinet Secretary an opportunity to make an opening statement before we move to questions. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much indeed, the convener, and thank you for inviting me to discuss the draft budget for 2015 and 16. I welcome the opportunity, as always, to give evidence this morning on this most important of subjects, ensuring that there's a fair and appropriate funding for the National Health Service in Scotland, an asset that I think is precious to us all. Over the next few years, the demand for health and social care and the circumstances in which it's delivered will be radically different. NHS Scotland must work with its partners across the public and voluntary sectors to ensure that it continues to provide the high quality health and care services that the people of Scotland expect and deserve, securing the best possible outcomes for people through the care and support they receive. It's within this context that we've developed our vision that by 2020, everyone is able to live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting. During 2012-13, a route map to the 2020 vision for health and social care was developed and has continued to provide a focus on the priorities that will have the greatest impact on achievement of our vision. The route map describes 12 priority areas for action in three domains. One, improving the quality of the care we provide. Two, improving the health of the population. And three, securing the value and financial sustainability of the health and care services we provide. I believe these three aims must be central and indeed are central to our funding commitments that are contained in the 2015-16 draft budget and I will briefly set out how this is the case. We are focused on ensuring that the care people receive is person-centred, safe and effective. What people expect are services that work in a coordinated way with them to understand what matters most in their lives and to build support around achieving the outcomes that are important to patients. Integrating care puts in place a framework to make sure that health and social care services are planned, resourced and delivered together by NHS boards and local authorities to improve outcomes for people using services, their carers and families. That's why we're allocating £100 million to support integrated partnerships and a further £73.5 million, an increase of £53.5 million on the £20 million previously announced to support the development of new models of care in local areas. In addition, ensuring appropriate care and treatment for these people, those people requiring very specialist and often expensive medicines for rare conditions remains a priority. That's why we're investing £40 million through the New Medicines Fund, which doubles the commitment I made last year. This investment last year supported the cost of 45 different medicines, benefiting more than 200 patients. By doubling the investment, we will see the fund having an even greater impact in 2015-16. NHS Scotland has a vital role in improving and maintaining the good health of the people of Scotland as a whole and in reducing health inequalities. The 2015-16 draft budget includes additional funding of £4.4 million to support the continued expansion of the Family Nurse Partnership with a focus on supporting parents in deprived communities. 
There will be additional funding of £4.6 million to support the extension of the immunisations programme and £8 million of funding will be used for the Getting It Right for Every Child programme, supporting the provision of person-centred, safe and effective care for women and babies. While Scotland's health is improving, it is improving more slowly than comparable European countries. We will therefore continue to pursue a preventive agenda with ongoing resource committed to alcohol intervention, reducing smoking rates and improving oral health. The mo securing the value and financial sustainability of the health and care services is also essential. The most dramatic reduction in public spending ever imposed in Scotland by the UK Government has seen a real terms decrease to the Scottish Government's resource budget of 6.7% since 2010-11. In the face of these cuts, there has been a real terms increase to the health resource budget of 3.5% over the same period, and we have delivered in our manifesto commitment to pass on the Barnet resource consequentials to health in full. For the first time in 2015-16, the health budget will rise to over £12 billion, and there will be a real terms increase to the total health budget from 2014-15 to, to 2015-16. The 2015-16 territorial boards will receive allocation increases of 2.7%, an increase above forecast inflation reflecting the importance we attach to protecting frontline point-of-care services. Those boards that are behind the NRAC parity, such as Grampian and Highland, will receive uplifts above the 2.7% average, reflecting a plan to move all boards to within 1% of NRAC parity by 2016-17, based on the current NRAC shares. Furthermore, over and above the full resource consequentials of £202 million that are being passed on to the National Health Service, £53.5 million has been added to the Integration Fund, and a further £32 million has been added to the previously published capital budget to support the continued investment in NHS Scotland infrastructure. The new South Glasgow Hospitals project will open in the summer of 2015, on time and on budget, while continued focus on the maintenance of the, of the NHS Scotland estate and equipment will be supplemented by the progression of projects being funded through the NPD and hub models, such as the Royal Ch Hospital for Sick Children in Edinburgh and the NHS and Fries and Galloway Acute Services Redevelopment. The Scottish Government remains committed to publicly funded healthcare services for the people of Scotland, which contribute directly to growth in the Scottish economy. The contrast between Scotland's approach to the health service based on its founding principles and the competition and privatisation being introduced in England is growing ever more pronounced. Our record of achievement is recognised internationally as innovative and aspirational in both its scope and in the potential for improving health and health care. For example, Scotland is now regarded as a world leader in patient safety. Yet I recognise that there are serious challenges ahead and that we need to ensure our plans are developed to meet the changing needs of the people of Scotland. That is why we will publish an update to our 2020 vision in the new year and why in 2015, 16 and beyond we will, one, increase the role of primary care through a focus on keeping people healthy in the community for as long as possible, two, integrate health and social care as part of the Scottish Government's commitment to public service reform. Three, further improve the quality of care we provide through the health care quality strategy. Four, focus on reducing health inequalities, particularly in the context of benefit cuts that will have the greatest impact on those at risk of ill health. For 2015-16, spending will be prioritised on further improving the quality of care we provide, improving the health of the population and securing the value and financial sustainability of the health and care services we provide. That is the approach we have taken in the health and wellbeing portfolio as detailed in the 2015-16 draft budget, which I commend to the committee and I am happy to answer any questions which the committee has for me this morning, convener. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We move to our first question, which is from Aileen McLeod. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, convener, and uh, also thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Can I, um, first of all, um, start by just welcoming the overall increase of um, 
uh, million pounds in the health resource spending, which will obviously see, as you said in your opening remarks, um, Cabinet Secretary, that it will see health spending rise above um, £12 billion for the first time, and it obviously underlines the government's commitment to protect the NHS resource uh, budget in real terms. Now, with the overall fiscal budget having reduced by 10% since 2010-11 um, by Westminster, which also includes the big cuts to capital, can I ask them, what's the, what is the total health uh, investment in 2014-15 um, through resource uh, capital uh, and the equivalent capital value of the NPD model and the hub programme and what's planned for 2015-16. Uh, you know, is there a, an increase in the overall health investment as well as an increase in the real terms for uh, resource and capital combined? Yeah, I'm, I'm ha actually happy to provide the committee with a detailed analysis of this because there's obviously some, been some debate about the comparative figures. You've got the figures in terms of cash and in terms of real increases. You've got the difference between the resource budget and the capital budget. And, of course, you've got the value of the NPD and hub capital investment programme, which sometimes is ignored by external an 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 analysts. And next year, we reckon the equivalent value of the NPD and hub programme is of the order of £380 million. In other words, had that been straightforward capital investment funded in the normal way, the NPD hub programmes would have been equivalent to about £380 million of capital expenditure on top of our normal capital budget uh, next year. But if you look at the percentage increases, and I'll take the, the cash and the real increases, if you include NPD and hub, uh, you then the overall health budget will increase in cash terms next year by 3.8%, in real terms by 2.2%, and if you exclude the NPD and hub programmes, there's still a cash increase of 1.7% and a real increase of 0.1%. So whichever way you look at it, uh, whichever way you cut it, real or cash, capital and revenue, uh, then uh, there is a, a real increase as well as a cash increase next year. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Cabinet Secretary. That sort of helps to kind of clarify. Um, just as a, a sort of follow-up, um, Convener, um, there was something that you said in your opening remarks, um, Cabinet Secretary, about refreshing the 2020 vision. And obviously, you know, one of the core parts to the budget this year has been with the, the integration fund. Can I therefore ask you how do you plan to refresh the 2020 vision, which is obviously um, central to making sure that our elderly and our vulnerable citizens um, can live at home or in a homeless setting for as, as long as possible. And that's obviously central to our aims for the uh, Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act. Well, I want to refresh it and to develop it. Let me give you an example of where I think it needs refresh. It's becoming very, very clear uh, at bo in both primary and acute care that the particular uh, challenges of the complexity of the care required by the very elderly population uh, requires some additional resource and some additional strategy. And that's not something that's going to be a one-off. If you look at the long-term ageing of the population very clearly, the percentage of the population who are going to be over 65 or over 75 or over 85 is going to rise significantly. It's estimated by the Registrar General there will be an 82% increase in the over 75-year-olds over the next 25 to 30 years or so. And in fact, I was reading the other day that the first person to live till they're 150 in the UK is already born. You never know, it could be somebody on this committee, or maybe even sitting at this side of the room. But So therefore, we want to, because uh, it's now uh, two years since the original 2020 vision was developed, so we want to refresh it and take account of emerging developments which weren't as clear two or three years ago, and the particular importance of the very elderly is a good example of that and the complexity of care they require. Secondly, I want to develop it. In particular, I think it's important for us to look at the capacity requirements to deliver what we're trying to deliver by 2020. Uh, as you know, we've substantially increased the staffing in the National Health Service in recent years, uh, over the last seven years. And uh, if you look at the nursing figures over the last year or two, for example, they have risen significantly. Uh, but still, we have significant skill shortages in key areas. For example, in remote uh, uh, rural and island communities, we have major challenges for all kinds of health staff. 
uh, we have particular challenges in some specialities like paediatrics and uh, some subspecialities within cancer. So we've got to, I think, have a very positive plan in place to identify how many people we need. I also think, and I've made this clear to the BMA and to the Academy of Royal Colleges, that I think we need to increase significantly, and this is a point of view shared by my colleague Michael Russell as the Cabinet Secretary for Education, we need to significantly increase the number of people going into medical school for the longer term. Because I think longer term, there is, because of so many people going part-time, the feminisation of the workforce, all the other trends, we are actually going to have to increase significantly the number of people being admitted to medical school to meet future manpower needs uh, and women power needs in the <coughs> National Health Service uh, in 10, 15, 20 years' time. So I'm very keen that we look at the forecast level and make up of demand as much as we can, and we include in the 2020 plan we're going to publish an overall strategic approach to capacity. I've already introduced quite a number of new tools, like the workforce tool, for uh, planning workforce requirements. Uh, the bed planning tool is being introduced as well. But I want to look at the overall picture nationally to see what staffing requirement is, is needed to deliver. Uh, and the other big challenge in all of this, of course, is the transition from where we are today to where we need to be. Now, we've already, as a society, done that with mental health. We've deinstitutionalized a large chunk of mental health services over the last 15, 20 years. We now need to do something similar with the rest of health provision. We're always going to need hospitals. People will always require, I'm sure, specialist acute care. But we do know there's an awful lot of people in hospital who had we the facilities in the community do not need, would not need to be in hospital. So we need that transition to get the facilities into the community, into primary care. Social care has a big role to play in this so that we can stop admitting people to hospital unnecessarily and treat them in the community. I think in terms of the, the refresh of the, the 2020 um, vision, as well as involving, obviously, politicians for cross-party support and stakeholders, that there'd be an opportunity there for the general public as well to be involved in a sort of discussion around the future priorities for the NHS. I'm very keen to involve all the stakeholders. I'm keen also to involve all the political parties and the committee as well. Um, so... You know, I'm looking at how I can do that uh, once we've got the kind of basics uh, set out. Uh, but I'm absolutely, I, th I, I think we should try and take as much of party politics out of as much of the health sector as we possibly can. I, I know it's difficult um, and I'm, I'm fully aware of the challenges that that presents for everybody. But I think it would be helpful if we can have a sensible debate um, without trying to score points off each other and we're all guilty of it. Even I'm guilty of it from time to time. Uh, and uh, I think it would be helpful if we could uh, have a sensible debate about the way forward. There are major challenges facing the National Health Service, not least because of the ongoing financial constraints that face us. And I think the more we can have a grown-up discussion about it, look at the challenges and how we're going to meet those challenges, the better. Yes. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> okay. It, thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. And you know this committee is up for that honest debate and that frank debate. And the more of the politics that we can cut out, the better. Maybe, you know, in terms of your introductory remarks, so, you know, with the new regime and less politics, we would have toned some of that down a wee bit. But could you could you tell me, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, are you describing new evidence here about the ageing process that have, has just come to light that can be shared by the committee? I think the, the new element I'm, I'm highlighting, highlighting, convener, is the feedback, and we've got no quantitative information at the moment, but it, when you talk to doctors, for example, in accident and emergency departments across Scotland, or talk to GPs, then they are beginning to highlight the, what they see as a, a group emerging as the very elderly with very complex conditions. They usually describe them as people over the age of 85, with very complex conditions. So when they come into A&E, you know, they, they do require a great deal of complex treatment. Let's say that we've been dealing with this issue for quite a, some time, along with yourselves and others. Ab absolutely. So what I was trying to press you on, is there new information here? Because what you're saying has been very evident for some considerable time. Well, I, I'm 
making a distinction between we've all been very, and there's loads of uh, you know, quantitative evidence on the number of older people and so on, but what I'm saying is that the very elderly is emerging yes. as one of the challenges. Yeah, but there is now, no new evidence. There's no, there's no new quantitative evidence okay. other than okay. the age group of people being admitted to E&E. But we all, we all accept the problem around here, and we're very anxious to get to that. That uh, get the facts on the table and whatever, and I come to staffing issues as well yeah. uh, about the new evidence there. And one of the, one of the themes that has come out over a period of time, and we've been through this process where we saw projected staffing levels and a significant increase for for, for instance about allied professionals as against a drop in nurses. Uh, that that policy has changed, and we're now rec you know, recruiting more nurses and and now you tell us more doctors. But what we hear in much of our evidence um, uh, is how do we evaluate what we actually need in, in the new workforce? Is it more doctors? Is it more nurses? Is it more allied professionals? Is it more carers um, um, you know, at a, a, a very local level or more skilled <coughs> carers or upskilling carers at a very local level? How do you evaluate that process, who has made the decision based on the evidence that will give us a certain outcome that it's, our priority is to, to recruit more doctors as against any of these other groups? Or is it doctors as well as all of these other groups? Can I say I think there are two questions in there, convener. First of all, how do we better forecast the profile of demand for health and social care in Scotland. And I've commissioned as part of our 2020 planning process a specific piece of work to be done on not just one-off forecasting, but how we establish a more method methodological approach uh, to ongoing forecasting. You know, when I was in the computer industry, for forecasting is where we started before we did any budgeting whatsoever. The first thing was to try and get a forecast of the level of demand in the economy for our products and what market share we would get and all the rest of it. And I think we need to do something more systematically than we've done in the past in health and social care. So uh, that is going to be that is part of the work that's being done in preparation for the refresh and development of the 2020 vision and plan, and that's something that we'll discuss with people once we'll get the results of it. Now, Cabinet this Secretary, this morning, that you have in discussions with your colleague in education, and you've announced that the plan is that we need uh, you know, more doctors coming through the system in the longer term. Now, in the absence, uh, the absence of that forecasting and that planning. And I think this is you know, a, a, an important question, even though I'm put, putting it myself, it's one of the criticisms about who we plan all of these services and, and what our needs are going to be. So you've announced doctors and a long-term recruitment process for having a level of doctor. And now you tell us you're going to have a, um, a systematic approach to the rec overall recruitment. Why are we why have we announced a longer term plan for doctors out with the detailed work that needs to take place to visualise the shape, size, skills of the new workforce for people who will not be dealt with in the main in hospital, but in the community? Let, let me take the example of GPs. We, we just need to look at the trend in GPs. Now, although we have uh, and we are by far further ahead in terms of the number of GPs per head, by far the top of the table in the UK, but for a 5.7% increase in the number of GPs working in the health service in Scotland over the last seven years. The problem, convener, is the hours the GPs are working and also the pattern of work. For example, there is a clear pattern of, uh, first of all, there's, there are many female doctors, GPs, than there used to be. So to give you an example, uh, an Ayrshire GP, lady GP, running her own practice, uh, advertised last year for a full-time GP. She had to employ three people part-time in order to get the equivalent full-time GP. So the trends are very much there already. The evidence is already there showing that even to stand still, because of the change in the percentage of doctors now wanting to work part-time or retire early, that we do know we're going to need more GPs just to stand still. 
and to meet a, an ageing population and a growing population, because remember Scotland's population is now forecast to grow to just under 6 million over the next 20 to 30 years, we do know we are going to have to need more GPs and overall more doctors. We know that the exact quantity uh, we require uh, clearly is part of the research we're doing in looking at longer term demand, longer term models of working and all the rest of it. It's not just about the number of patients, it's about the complexity. It's also about the mix of doctors because we do know, for example, that uh, there are far fewer doctors going into being GPs or into A&E departments than was the, the case maybe 40 or 50 years ago in terms of percentages because of the work-life balance. And there's very clear evidence in all of that. So what I'm saying to you is the evidence is pointing very clearly on the need, and I saw Dr Simpson nodding his agreement when I said it, on the need to increase the number of people going into medical school to fill the pipeline required. The exact number has to be forecast. That's a detailed forecasting exercise. Now, absolutely. Nothing, nothing no, absolutely. This. this is just meeting demand. There's not naturally absolutely. planning that. And it's been evident for... You know, since we've been sitting at this committee and the previous committee, I, I suppose, we're recruiting just to stand still and doctors. The point I yeah. suppose I'm making is, with the 2020 vision and the money that's going into the 20 division, 20, the challenge for us, government and indeed politicians, and certainly this committee, because we're very much up for this, is how we visualise a new workforce that is not based on the existing model that is just replacing what is there. And in the budget process, we are searching for the evidence that what we're doing is changing the nature of how health would be delivered in 2020. I think, I think that's what, what, what we're doing, Cabinet Secretary. Well, that, that's and that's a, what we want to be seriously involved in. And, well, and that would... That will be informed, I think, by the forecasting exercise that we're engaging in at the moment and looking at the modelling of demand uh, as forecast for the future. Now, forecasting is not an exact science, so you have to build in contingencies and caveats, and you then have to translate a national figure into cascading it down to regional and local level. But clearly, I think we've got to get better at forecasting the profile of demand, not just the numbers, but the pattern of demand for from patients in Scotland so that we can cater for that in the future. The grant. Thank you. Um, just as a, an additional, you said to Aileen McLeod you'd provide further information for us um, on figures and the like. I was wondering if you could include in that uh, the figures taking into account um, health inflation as well as uh, normal inflation, and also maybe draw up for us, taking into account the Director of Finance's paper, how the new monies coming forward meets their perceived demand on the health service. I think that would be helpful for us yeah, while scrutinising the budget. In additional, if, you can, uh, if, maybe afterwards, if the clerk gives us just a list of the additional information you're looking for, and we'll be glad to, to provide and facilitate that, Rona, not a problem. No, that would be useful. Um, I, my question leads on quite well from Duncan's question. It's about um, the increasing use of private services within the NHS to fill in demand where that's required. And that happens if I'm going to be parochial in my area where the need for locums and the like, where we have difficulty in recruiting into posts happens. <coughs> we all know that private services cost an awful lot more um, to, to pay for but rather than... Um, delivery from the public sector. How do you? How, what are your plans to meet that demand? How do, how do you mean to to overcome that um, use of private services within the NHS? Well, first of all, in terms of the overall use of private services, let's get that into perspective. The share of the budget going to the private sector in Scotland last year was 0.84%, which is exactly where it was as a percentage of the budget in the first year when we came in, the, the percentage that we inherited. Uh, and as the Auditor General in last week's report pointed out, uh, over the previous year and last year, there was actually a decline in the use of the private sector in the National Health Service in Scotland. And I have issued directions again this year to the L in, as part of the LDP, Local Delivery Planning Mechanism, guidance to the boards to further reduce the use of the private sector. 
where we use the private sector in Scotland isn't to replace existing capacity within the National Health Service. That's what's happening south of the border. That's what's called privatisation or commercialisation. Where we use the private sector in Scotland is where we buy in capacity that we do not have within the health service itself. Uh, and that is a big difference. That's not privatising services. That's buying in capacity from elsewhere that we currently do not have. For example, there are some diagnostic tests which are done in the private sector because we don't have the specialism required to do them. Uh, and from time to time, there is a provision for treatment in the private sector because we don't have the capacity to do it in the National Health Service. But that's very different from privatising National Health Service facilities, National Health Service procedures and operations and all the rest of it. And as I say, the, the trend... Sorry to interrupt you. Are you saying that the use of locums, the use of the well, British Nur that. Nursing Association are not included in the, the figures for private... The, service the, provision the, the, the locum figures will be included in the staffing. It's, it's a subdivision of the staffing and, and locum figures. Uh, and let me make a distinction here between nursing staff and medics, clinicians. In terms of nursing staff, uh, the percentage of the budget going on agency nursing is now down to 0.1% of the total, I think I'm right in saying, of the total staffing cost for nurses. But we have typically, on average across Scotland, about 5 to 6 per cent of all nursing is provided by bank nurses. The vast majority of nurses are actually nurses already working in the National Health Service. Uh, and while I would like to further reduce in some boards the use of bank nursing and have more permanent staff, Overall, I think having a 5 or 6% level of bank nursing, which is equivalent to supply teachers in the education sector, for example, I think is a reasonable figure, uh, given all the demands in the health service. When it comes to locums, I am very concerned about the increase in the use of locums uh, for GPs, for other doctors' positions in A&E &E and elsewhere, particularly short-term locums, because if you've got a long-term locum, locum, then in terms of patient safety, that's OK. But I think if you get a continual churn of short-term locums, it raises issues of patient safety, as well as the economics uh, of the health service. Now, typically, a locum doctor um, costs 180% of the, of the equivalent, uh, you know, for, for an NHS employee or a GP. That's usually made up of 130% of, of that goes to the, the doctor because of 100% the normal P plus 30% for moving about or whatever. And 50% traditionally has gone to an outside agency who arranges the locum. So we are engaged in a process at the moment of bringing in that part of it so that the, the organisation of the locums is brought in-house and that chunk of the money, that 50%, is recycled within the National Health Service and not going to outside agents. I think that's very important. And that's part of our overall strategy to reduce the use of locums. And the way to do that, of course, is uh, recruiting permanent doctors uh, and to try to... Uh, address the issues that are causing us difficulty, for example, in attracting people into being a GP. The work-life balance, I get, is the main reason. In remote rural areas, very often the reason given is not actually the, the issue around the GP, it's around the issue of finding a job for the spouse. Uh, for example, as you know, we've advertised Narna Machen for eight GPs. Uh, I think we only so far have had one or two at the most applications. And if you talk to the GPs who were there previously, then very often the reason they didn't stay long and moved on was because their spouse uh, couldn't find employment in the area. Um, so there's, this is quite a complex issue. Um, there's an overall shortage in certain skills. There's an overall challenge of getting people to go to r rural areas and island communities, for example. There's the feminisation uh, of the workforce, uh, leading to more part-time work in many cases. There's now evidence, very anecdotal, let me say, but evidence that even, you know, uh, there's a general trend towards part-time working, particularly of people in their uh, late 50s and early 60s, leading up to retirement. 
There's also anecdotal evidence because of the pension changes and the reduction in the cap that some doctors are reducing their out of hours and some doctors are retiring earlier than they otherwise would have done. So these are all challenges in terms of recruiting and retaining the people we need. I, I'm aware of those and indeed I think I've asked um, the Cabinet Secretary in the past to look at working with other public and indeed private agencies about how you provide career opportunities for the partners of the staff you require so that they can come relocate and have a job for say a year to 18 months until they find something in that area because that's a huge barrier for people moving around fine in the central belt but the moment you, you move out of the central belt uh, to people have careers and you're only off offering one of them a job just doesn't work. And I've, I've done some work with Highlands and Islands Enterprise on this, so maybe the Cabinet Secretary would take an interest in that and we might be able to push it along that way. Well, um, as you know, we funded Highland Board, the Highland Health Board to the tune of £1.5 on behalf of all rural health boards in Scotland to look at this entire issue of what more we can do to recruit and retain doctors in rural areas. Can I just ask for confirmation on the statement you made about locums, though? You... If I picked you up correctly, you said that locums are not accounted for in the private provision budget, but in the staffing budget. You do want to explain yeah, that. yeah, no, no, that's right. The, the the information on private sector spend is about um, services for um, so where, where you use other hospital facilities and things like that. So the the spend on either nurse agency spend or um, medical agency spend is not included in that. Is it possible to get a note of that with the other note that? Yes. Yep. 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 We, can, we can provide the, the actual available. cost for this year. That would be far. Yeah. very useful. Thank you. But as I say, I'm very keen that we, in future, we are in the process of bringing the locums in house so that, that a, the element of the agency, which has always been done by a private agency, is brought in house because I would rather have the money circulating around the health service than circulating in the private sector. It's always been the case it's been accounted for in that way. It wasn't. Yes. Uh, it's not, it's not, there's no, no, no change there's no in change. the accounting procedure. No, there's no yeah, change. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that's fine. Um, Gil, Gil Patterson. Much well, convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I listened very carefully to the radio this morning and the convener touched upon it. And uh, you made an announcement that you would be spending an additional uh, £40 million on GP uh, uh, services. And I wondered if that was actually new money to the health service and if not, where, where does it come from for uh, GP practices? Well, overall, uh, as you know, next year, as well as passing on the Barnet consequentials, we've also increased the overall health revenue budget, resource budget, by an, an additional £61 million. Um, we have specifically funded this initiative uh, by using up the money left in the Commonwealth Games reserve that was part of the health portfolio's budget uh, by using the migrant surcharge, which is part of the uh, fallout from some recent Westminster legislation, and from redirecting money from elsewhere from lower priority areas of spend into what I think is a top priority is increasing investment in primary care. So overall, I, I think this is a, a worthwhile investment as part of a general strategy to further enhance investment in primary care. Uh, other elements in that strategy have included as part of the guidance to the boards as part of the LDP process is for this year, and it will be the same for next year, which is an instruction to individual territorial boards to increase uh, their provision for primary care. Uh, we've also, as you know, negotiated a three-year contract with the GP committee of the BMA in Scotland, and part of that has been substantially reducing the bureaucracy imposed on GPs by that contract so that GPs are freer to spend time with their patients rather than have to fill in forms for the Scottish Government or anyone else. And it's also part of as directing funding to our key priorities. Uh, for example, we had a £10 million telehealth fund to extend telehealth services eventually to up to another 300,000 people with complex conditions throughout Scotland and to, you know, to match uh, funding from elsewhere. We've got the integration fund, and that's to help with the transition from where we are to where we need to be in terms of bringing together adult health and social care and treating people at home instead of in hospital. 
Uh, so it's all part and parcel of investing heavily in primary care and community facilities as part of the transition from treating so many people in hospital to treating people at home. I, I noticed that you, you did say that there's a prospect of savings uh, uh, because of that. But I, I wondered uh, how, how you plan to rule it out uh, by, by board or by uh, how it would impact on individual practices. Well, and I'm, I'm particularly interested, uh, I mean, you know, if I talk about my own constituency, we have uh, one part of the constituency, uh, a substantial part of it, very deprived, but we've got another part that's quite well well off. But in the well-off area, you can you can see the, the the problems in the deprived area. But in the well-off area, there happens to be an enormous uh, a number of uh, uh, elderly people. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you know the average age is something like 89, uh, I believe. So. There's a particular problem there. Will there be a benefit across the board? Or? Yeah, well, one of the influences for doing this was conversations, for example, with a doctor you're familiar with from Mulgai, and one of the points he made is that more of his very elderly patients are being hospitalised because, quite frankly, they don't have enough facilities and resources in the primary care sector to prevent that happening. And, of course, the worst thing you can do for somebody at that age uh, is unnecessarily hospitalise them. So we've identified three areas to give examples of where this money will be channelled. Uh, practices where there is an above average percentage of elderly or very elderly patients um, will get additional support. Uh, rural communities, remote rural communities and island communities will get additional support because we have particular challenges there. Uh, and of course the deep end practices. Now if you take the deep end practices, uh, we have, I think it's a total of seven link workers working in deep end practices at the moment in Glasgow. Those link workers are clearly making a material difference to uh, helping the GP practice with the very challenging situation they have in their particular areas. So this money could help fund additional link workers, for example, if that's what's needed, in more deep end practices. So it's very, very much geared towards where the many the, where the pressures are in the primary care sector. But we also want, both with this fund and with other funds, to roll out more of the pilots on a permanent basis. For example, uh, we have what is called the St Andrews model, which is very akin to the NUCA model of GP delivery um, based <coughs> in Alaska, uh, which has been highly successful in Alaska. You can't just lift it from Alaska and transplant it, but some underlying principles that are very important, which are very successful. And we have been piloting the NUCA model in Scotland, and indeed there's a new... Uh, NUCA model being opened by Jason Leach, our pr the Director of Quality in Edinburgh, on Friday. And I would like to roll out more of that because it's very clear that that particular model for delivering GP services can be very, very successful in dramatically improving the outcomes achieved by patients and reducing simultaneously some of the pressure on GPs. So I'm very, very keen to look at new ways of working. We've also done some pilots uh, with telehealth services run by GPs for older people with very complex conditions. And a number of those pilots have resulted during the pilot phase of a reduction of up to 70% in hospitalisation of patients. So again, through the telehealth fund, the integration fund, the primary care fund, we want to uh, try to roll out as much of that as we possibly can, as quickly as we can. OK, thanks. I might come back later on. Yes, thank you. Richard Simpson? Yes, um, I think if I could just start by saying, you know, my general disappointment is that 15 years on, we've still got nine pages or ten pages of 185 pages in the budget paper devoted to that's all to health. And we're still in the situation that we're grappling for information. But having said that, I welcome the fact that the, the consensus which was achieved in June on the 2020 vision principles between all five parties is to be continued and look forward to part participating in that. Um, what uh, the Cabinet Secretary has just been talking about uh, in terms of distribution to primary care is, is very welcome. Um, but it's interesting that what you were saying was the distribution would be on the basis of those with a, an elderly or very elderly population, remote and rural population, and those in the deep end, which is, of course, inequalities, which is NRAC. I mean, these are the three principles of NRAC, and there was 
that was the basis of distribution to health boards since 1999, since the Arbuthnot formula. So it's been around for 18 years, and yet what we haven't achieved is the move from the health board's funding into these practices. So I welcome the fact that the centre is now going to be more d directional in this, in this respect. Uh, could I ask him just if, if, if he can provide us with a link to the local development plans? Because I'm finding great difficulty in getting access to these. So the local development plans for last year, or for the current year rather, it would be very useful to see those because we were supposed to see primary care being highlighted within those. And the ones I've been able to attain, I can't really see this at all. So I would, I would value that. However, my main question, convener, actually relates to the section of improving health and better public health. Uh, the Health Improvement and Health Equalities budget, which is budgeted this year for 55.6 million, uh, but in the draft plans, it was last uh, uh, last year in the in the draft budget, uh, it was 64.4 million. So even allowing for the transfer to family nurse partnership of 4.4 million, there's actually been a cut since three years ago in in the health improvement and health inequalities budget. If we look down that list, we, you know, immunizations are up, yes, and I know we've got new rotavirus and, 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 and shingles um, vaccination programs. Very welcome. Good preventive measures. Excellent. Pan pandemic flu preparation down because, of course, we, we, we're just restocking on that. But if we come to tobacco and alcohol almost use, over a period of almost four years, these have not increased. And in the case of the alcohol budget, has actually gone down. So, you know, I'm really trying to grapple with what all the very positive and nice things that the Cabinet Secretary has been saying uh, about uh, shifting to prevention, about the whole Christie agenda, really, and the agenda that this committee has repeatedly talked about over the years. I'm trying to equate that with a budget in which health improvements cut, tobacco control is cut in real terms, flatline for three or four years now, alcohol must use down you know, how does this actually equate? Can I just first of all say, as you probably know, um, if you take alcohol abuse, we've actually been making substantial progress on that in terms in recent years, not as much as any of us would like. Um, but uh, I think I think the problem. Can I make a general point about the budget? And, the, and I take the point about presentation. Um, and it's like uh, some of the figures produced by the Royal College of uh, GPs uh, over the last couple of days are figures we don't recognise and we think we know where they're making a mistake. Um, and one of the, the mistakes being made is taking one line that says GMS contract and assuming that's the totality of what's going into GPs and into primary care. And similarly with healthcare improvement and prevention activity, um, I think there's a danger in taking one particular budget line, which is which is headlined that, and assuming that that's a totality, because it's not. Because as you know, uh, Dr. Simpson, there are many other aspects of the health budget, including within the territorial budget, uh, the, the budgets of the territorial boards, where there's work going on uh, that's not necessarily feeding into that budget line because we don't put it in twice, we just put it in once, obviously. So I think you've got to look at the total picture. And I think if you look at the total picture on alcohol and on tobacco, uh, then the strategies we're following, I think, are the right strategies. Indeed, the co latest consultation we have produced, which covers, for example, e-cigarettes, uh, I would think we're going to get a broad, cons I would hope, a broad consensus on our approach to that. Now, that actually doesn't involve any money. Some, most of those measures don't involve any money to be spent by the health portfolio. Uh, they are, uh, the money that would be spent would be enforcement monies probably through the justice uh, budget or environmental health budget and local government. But the important thing, I think, is not what's in the particular budget line. The important thing is, is the overall strategy working? And there are clear signs that our smoking strategy is working in, in many respects, but I think we'd work a lot better if we had minimum unit pricing, obviously. Uh, and particularly in alcohol, I think we are achieving some success. We have a long way to go, but I think there are clearly signs that we are having a degree of success. So I don't think you can just take a budget line in the budget and relate that to um, success or failure in terms of the overall strategy, because there are many other parts of our budget and indeed other people's budgets 
that come into deciding the success or failure of these strategies? Well, if I can take the tobacco control area, I mean, I think on alcohol, I would agree with you. I think since 2005, indeed, since the Licensing Act, which as a minister, I was responsible for initiating the stuff on that with the Commission. Um, and since 2005, the alcohol consumption in Scotland has been dropping, although it's flatlined in the last year, I think, but has dropped. And the discounting part of the bill has actually caused an increased drop beyond that dro the drop in England, which is parallel. But if we take tobacco, which is the one that really worries me, because it has actually flatlined for the last few years. We're not, you know, we've got it down to about 23%, roughly, I think. Uh, but if you take Australia, even before plain packaging, it was down at 15%. You know, we, we seem to be stuck. And if you, you subdivide it into bits, we're stuck on, you know, we've got little progress in terms of the variation between uh, different socioeconomic groups. Uh, you know, the more deprived communities are still smoking around 38%, you know, significant numbers. So... You know, and, and the consequences for the health budget, of course, are absolutely enormous. So I'm, I'm afraid I just don't accept in the tobacco control area, and the alcohol I understand because you've got alcohol brief interventions, you've got the whole justice agenda as well. So, you know, we can agree that maybe that's an area where things are happening. But tobacco control really does worry me that we are not making progress on that. And if I can take one particular instance, the, the, the improvements in pregnancy smoking rates are really tiny. We're stuck at 18 or 19 percent on that, really significant. And yet there have been pilots in Dundee of you know, paying people to come off. I know we're attacked in Daily Mail and places for that, but if it works, it works. And if it works, we should support it. And, you know, so I just don't see where we're going with that. And I, and I think the budget line reflects, if I may say so, Cabinet Secretary, a complacency which your strategy doesn't reflect. So it's as usual. We've got great strategy. But, you know, I just question the implementation. Can I give you an example? I, I mean, my, my view is that we spend a lot on public health. Every, every part of Scotland has got a... Every board has a public health department with a director of public health with very substantial resources. Now, my own feeling is that we're not perhaps maximising the impact of our public health resource. And I have asked the Acting Chief Medical Officer, Aileen Keel, to look at the whole area of our public health resource to see where we can make it much more effective. Because I don't believe we're doing as much. I think because it's divided into 14 might be one of the reasons. But we need to look. I don't want to prejudice the outcome of what Aileen, the work Aileen Dr Keel is doing. It's not just in terms of tobacco and alcohol. I think in terms of our public health effort and strategy, we also could and should be doing more in terms of exercise and diet. Because if you look at the three biggest killers in Scotland and many other diseases, stroke, heart and cancer, if we could get an exercise regime in the population, even a modest amount of walking by, by people, uh, and an improvement in their diet, then through time we will see, very, as you know, very substantial improvements uh, in, reduction, in reducing the incidence of cancer, heart, and heart attacks and stroke, uh, if we're able to do that. So can I say, in general terms, I think we do need to look at how we make far, far greater use of our public health resource in the prevention agenda, concentrating on uh, exercise, diet, tobacco and alcohol, uh, and, and to some extent drugs abuse, although that's more of a, a wider issue. I say so just in conclusion, convenient for my, this questioning, um, I, I entirely agree with you. I think that our public health, because it's based in, in, the, in, the, in the health boards, and the health boards are primarily focused on the acute sector, that they are actually missing something quite strongly. That's not to have cast dispersions at the individuals involved. Many of them are excellent, but it nevertheless is a problem. It is probably the only area in which I think in what's happening in England is something we should look at. I think the Cabinet Secretary and I would agree that most of what's happening in England is stuff we don't want to even go near or touch. But in public health, they have moved that to the local authorities uh, and to the community pl planning partnership equivalents in England, I mean, the health and well-being boards, etc. So, and I think that really we need to look very closely at the possibility 
of moving public health into the, into the local authority sector where they can have an effect on exactly the things you're talking about because many of the things like licensing, availability of licenses, etc., are all within the purview of the local authority. And frankly, public health input to those, from my experience, is, is um, insufficient on, say, alcohol availability licenses to actually allow the licensing boards to confront the sheriffs and say, we want, don't want to give a license in this area. They just don't have the backing of the public health in the way they need it. I, I absolutely agree. There's a debate, but I had my own preference is that we, uh, the, the, the public, public health as a function, since the war, since the Second World War, has been a bit of a yo-yo in terms of where it sat. It originally sat within local authorities. Then under the Heath reforms in the early 70s, it was transferred to the health sector and it's remained there ever since. But local authorities clearly have a role to play. And I actually think since we're creating 32 integrated partnerships, yes. actually they could have a much bigger role in this because they bring together the role of the health service with the local authorities. And it seems to me there's a real opportunity here for us to do much, much more on the public health agenda. Thank you. We'll have a session on that on its own, I think. Bob Doris. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, opportune moment for a quick supplementary about um, Dr Simpson was just saying there, Cabinet Secretary. We've got a community empowerment bill um, going through the Scottish Parliament. If we had Harry Burns here time and again, the former Chief Medical Officer, he would talk about tackling alienation, isolation and lack of empowerment mm -hmm. has been key drivers to get people to make positive lifestyle choices such as uh, smoking cessation, alcohol reduction, increased exercise and the like. So just in I think the spirit of Dr Simpson's line of questioning as well, in terms of the public health agenda, will the Cabinet Secretary be doing any work in conjunction with, I think it's Derek Mackay that's taken forward that, that piece of work going forward to map out positive public health benefits of community empowerment, particularly in the most deprived communities, because I think what Dr Simpson was driving at was the connectivity um, between those who are actually on the, round, on the ground at the grassroots trying to deliver or sometimes lecture a public health message rather than capacity build within communities to allow them to make positive lifestyle choices rather than just focus on telling people what they're doing wrong. So is there any connectivity between your department and what uh, uh, the Minister's doing? Yeah, absolutely. There is actually a ministerial group looking at the future of, of community planning partnerships and the need to make them much more proactive in terms of getting greater complementarity and coordination between all the public services at a local level. And obviously the health boards and the integrated uh, boards uh, as well as the local authorities obviously have a major role to play in that because I think as Richard Simpson rightly said if you take initially like public health initially like alcohol it's not just a health service issue it's a local authority issue it's an education issue uh, and it's a criminal justice issue just to pick three departments that would be involved in that so at local level I think the community planning partnerships are the tools to get an agreed strategy with everybody then delivering their respective bits of the strategy in a joined up way, in a coordinated way. And that is how we are developing the community planning partnerships for the future so that they can be much more effective in doing that than they've quite frankly been in the past. I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned community planning partnerships. I, I won't go down the, the tangent of that other than to put on the record, convener, of saying that, of course, communities should be involved in community planning and not just uh, uh, erstwhile officials telling communities what they need. And that's sometimes a structural problem with community planning partnerships. But I think we'll leave that sitting there. It can be a disempowerment. For another committee. Uh, well, I, I merely leave that sitting. But what is in this committee's budget scrutiny, Cabinet Secretary, is the budget line in relation to health and social care integration. I listened to your opening remarks and I, I, th I think I heard you talk about the £100 million that sits within the baseline budget of territorial health boards and the £73.5 million, a significant increase in the standalone budget line within the overall health budget. So that's a significant increase in expenditure. Tell me, is, is that monies that was previously maybe considered to be change fund monies, for example? Is, is some of it in relation to that? Because obviously there was change fund resources before for innovation with health boards and local authorities in the third sector to do the kind of integration type of work. So how should we view the 
that that budget line and how it's intended to be used. Let me make it absolutely clear. The integration fund is not a successor fund to the change funds. The integration fund is very specifically about ma helping to manage and oil the wheels of the transition uh, from where we are, where we don't treat people enough in the community and we, we over-hospitalise in terms of health care in Scotland. You know, it's estimated a third of the people who are in Scottish hospitals at any one time if the facilities existed in the community could be treated and treated more effectively in the community. But it's how you get from where we are to where we need to be, and that hundred million is part of that jigsaw, is to help the transition. Uh, and it's very specifically, uh, we can send you the detail, but Michael Mathis and my colleagues have been leading on this, to develop it so that it helps the transition uh, into much greater treatment at home rather than a uh, hospitalisation, and that just part of the overall budget. It wasn't, you know, money sp specifically taken from anywhere. It was just when we we're doing the, th uh, the review, we identified that part of this money should be the hundred million should be allocated to this function. So, also the seventy-three point five million pounds. We can view that as the, the national government will work with a uh, health board and local authority partners to determine the best use of that, but the £100 million set within territorial health boards is for them to work collegiately with local authorities to drive the changes that are needed. Yeah, we've, we've actually, you know, we've uh, had heavy stakeholder involvement right across the board, including the third sector, and how to make the best use of this money to achieve the objective, which, as I say, is the transition. There are other initiatives which are uh, within the health service primarily or in social care or jointly, which are also part and parcel of the overall strategy of making this transition. I mean, Hospital at Home, which is a programme initiated by NHS Lanage, are now being rolled out across other parts of the health service in Scotland, is another part of this transition from treating people in hospital to treating them at home. So the integration fund should be seen within that wider context. This is part of the strategic change that we need to make in the next five years. I understand that, and um, I was just trying to suppose, tease out uh, how the £100 million is for locally set priorities, third sector, health board, local authority, for the uh, uh, using the principles that, that you see, Cabinet Secretary, the £73.5 million, much more of a national strategy and how that money is directed. Uh, the reason I mentioned the change fund, of course, is that that was to, to drive local pilots uh, across 32 local authorities in Scotland, and where they weren't successful, that was OK. That's the point of local pilots, to see what flies and what doesn't. But where they were successful, for a transition to be made from uh, temporary funding and innovation to drive change to be embedded in what territorial health boards and local authorities do as core business, in other words, to mainstream the funding of that. And I'm sure that this, this committee must, must be ready soon to do a final review of how, how successful change funds have been across the country. But going back to the Health and Social Care Integration Fund, I suppose what I'm hoping to, to tease out is whether or not we should expect, and I hope the answer will be no, uh, we, we should expect some of that £100 million to continue with some of the pilots which had been done under the change fund to keep them going, that could be a new budget line for them to be used rather than, main, rather than to mainstreamed into core service provision. So the £100 million, Cabinet Secretary, I'm really trying to get, is this for, for new things rather than to uh, be about direct service provision for things that health boards and, lo uh, and local authorities in the voluntary sector collegiately should be doing anyway? Uh, uh, I'm trying to tease out how the money should be spent. And I think if you start to pick out individual bits of money and, and then try and over-describe um, them, I think the key thing is that we have this overall strategic approach, which is to go from where we are to where we need to be, which is about treating people at home much more than we're doing today. There are a number of things we need to do to do that. Um, for example, we need to get hospital at home. Uh, much more. We need to develop telehealth and telemedicine services along the lines I've described many times to reduce the level of hospitalisation. We need to invest in primary care services uh, more uh, targeted at the areas I've uh, announced on this morning. And the integration fund is also part of that jigsaw, both the 100 million, which is very much aimed at the, the, the next generation coming into being elderly 
are treated differently in, this, in terms of how they go through the system and the service provision from days gone by. The 73 million is for, and that's delivered at local level, the 73 billion is for national initiatives. The 10 million telehealth money, I think, comes out of the 73 million, for example, and the 40 million I announced this morning comes out of the 73 million. And I'm hoping to increase the 73 million if I can in future. Uh, but that the, the, that integration fund is not about funding leftover projects from the change fund, if I can put it that way. Uh, anything that's been successful during the change fund period, the whole idea was that it would be mainstream. Let me give you an example. Uh, one of the projects, and I'm just picking this as an example, one of the projects funded by the change fund was the creation of a step, what is called a step-up, step-down facility in Midlothian. And that's for people en route to hospital or more usually about being discharged from hospital. As you know, we have a, a mounting problem at the moment with delayed discharges. Um, we'd made substantial progress, but this year has seen a major increase in the number of delayed discharges, uh, particularly in the specific local authority areas. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that these local authorities don't have the places or don't have the funding, they say, always ready to hand at the right time to uh, fund people to go into a residential care facility or because their, their house isn't ready with adaptations or whatever to allow them to be discharged from hospital. So um, what Modlothian have done is create a step down, for step up, step down facility so that if you're ready to be discharged medically, but your house isn't ready for you to go back to your house or the support package isn't in place, you go into this kind of midway situation where you will be properly looked after. Uh, any medical needs that you have that don't require hospitalisation will continue to be met and you can stay there and be well looked after until you are ready to go home when the care package is in place or when you're physically fit enough to go home. Um, now, I actually now want to see at least one step up, step down facility in every part of Scotland because, quite frankly, it is a fundamental part of the jigsaw if we are to achieve our objectives of getting people out of hospital and not having them stay in hospital longer than they need to be. So I now would expect the integrated board, the integration board in Midlothian to continue to fund that facility on a permanent mainstream basis. And, and, and that's a very good example of what we expect to happen. The change fund projects, when evaluated, that haven't worked particularly well. Some of them will probably come to an end. Some of them may be, uh, reappear in a modified format. But the integration fund is not about funding the continuation of change fund projects. That's helpful, and I'm, I'm sure local authorities and health boards are listening to those words when we come back to scrutinise uh, their expenditure, as we will do in, in a few months' time. I think it's important to have clarity around that. I had one other budget line I wanted to look at, convener, and that was in relation to mental health improvement and service delivery. So I'm picking ones where I, I can see an increase in it to ask what the thinking is b b behind that. Um, and, and I actually looked at, before this morning, I looked at uh, the, the Sam H. Worried Sick report, in relation to uh, how they believe the pressures welfare reform has put on some of the most vulnerable people in relation to mental health services, and 98% of their clients that they surveyed believe that their mental health had deteriorated because of welfare reforms and, and cuts by, by the UK government. Now, this might be a complete red herring. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I have no idea whether the uplift in that is a recognition to some of the additional pressures that are building on that, whether that could be included within the Scottish Government talk about £82 million a year being spent to mitigate welfare reforms across Scotland. Does some of that, does that sit within the health budget when you come to that figure? Um, I'm just trying to tease out, because that's a significant uplift that I'm seeing there, 6.3% uplift, which I welcome. It's just to get some of the rationale behind how that feeds into it. And when I read that Sam H report, I was wondering if there was a connectivity there between the decision the Government had made and these kind of factors. Excuse me, can I say we do recognise that um, the financial pressures on people, particularly people on benefit, is undoubtedly leading to additional stress and in some cases to uh, more severe mental health problems. The, the role of the link worker in deep end practices is actually one of the things that they have been doing. 
is uh, people who uh, do suffer problems because of financial pressure. There's very often a lot of support mechanisms available, but people don't know about them. Uh, and what the link worker does is put them in touch with these services. But this particular line that you referred to, Bob, is the, the vast bulk of that is actually responding to the challenge of dementia. Uh, and also, some of it is for three and four year old parenting uh, as part of our uh, strategy in getting it right for every child. But uh, dementia obviously presents a major challenge. Now, we've been very, very successful uh, compared to other parts of the UK in terms of a uh, rate of diagnosis of dementia. It's now 20% higher than anyone else, mainly because of what we do when people are admitted to hospital in terms of the health checks. The undergoing dementia is one of them for particularly older people, obviously. Uh, but this is recognising the additional resource uh, primarily that needs to go into dementia care. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Convener, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that that exchange, I think, highlights, you know, in my humble opinion, that, that some of the challenges we have here about providing scrutiny. You know, the, the £100 million um, the Cabinet Secretary um, that you described was available was money taken from, wasn't money taken from anywhere. It just sums up the challenge that we've got in terms of providing scrutiny. Because the £100 million must have came from somewhere. And the other aspect of this is about how, when any amount of money, whether it be the total budget, and I think um, Professor Bell put it last week in a, a provocative way, not a controversial way, when he, when he asked who's making the decisions about the investment in me men mental health rather than childcare? Who's making the evaluations? Or are we just going along with draft budget, doing, because we're locked into doing, you know, go back to my original theme, doing what we have to do that prevents us innovating and making these evaluations about where we are going to get the best health benefit? Who made the decision that that was the important decision to make to increase that mental health line? to change the nature and, and, and get the outcomes that we, we would want there. Now, who made that decision? Was that decision based on just the basic demand and need? Was it based on changing the services? Was it based on getting a, a greater bang for your buck for that £100 million? Are, you know, what drives these decisions within government to ensure that we get in a very constrained situation the absolute best value for quality outputs. Uh, and I think that's a, uh, that's a challenge that recorded and was the theme it was recording through all of the evidence we had. Who's making these decisions? How accountable are we uh, in, in this whole process? And how transparent is this process so that we can see where we're spending, why we're spending it, and here are the outcomes that yeah. justify those decisions. Can I say specifically in that line, uh, that's dri very much driven by the needs of our dementia strategy, which we've agreed and published, and uh, we need to fund, obviously, the implementation of the dementia strategy. And similarly, we, the, t in relation to children, the GIRFIC and the child care strategy and the quality strategy all feed into that. But you make a very valid point about how do we judge where we get best value for money and where, where should we put our resources in future to get the best bang for the buck, as George Reid used to call it. And we've got a fair amount of work going on throughout government, including in the health department, looking at this. For example, and I'll get Christine to give you some more detail, um, one of our uh, organisations that promotes good practice, Quest, is specifically looking at how we can better evaluate the impact of programmes. Uh, and, or the likely impact of programmes to help us decide where best to channel our resources. There's also work going on in other areas, for example, Health Scotland, which uh, does a lot of work on alcohol abuse. Uh, and uh, that, that has been look, one of the things they've been doing is looking at the impact of particular policies uh, or particular spend. So that in individual parts, you also have people, before, before they decide what the right strategy is, they're looking at the impact of what has worked and worked elsewhere. I mean, minimum unit pricing, for example, 
uh, if you look at the impact of minimum unit pricing in Canada, uh, then a lot of that originated from some of the work that we've seen elsewhere in terms of what works, what doesn't work. If you take dementia, we're actually, in, I mean, the Japanese dementia strategy is taking into account what we're doing in Scotland because one of the innovative things we're doing in Scotland is heavily involving people with dementia in the design and development of the dementia strategy and the way forward. And that has been a huge plus in terms of the quality of the strategy and internationally now renowned as very, very good practice indeed. So there's no single, there's no single influence, there's a range of influences, but you know, in an ideal world, we'd be able to sit and look at, if we spend money there, that'll be the impact we'll get. If we spend it there, that's the impact we'll get. But of course, a lot of this is also changing, changing goalposts a bit as things change. But you're absolutely right. We do need, right across government, not just in Scotland, right across government, probably across the developed world, we need to get better at evaluating the impact of programmes and where do you get the best bang for the buck. More interested about how it influences spending. I think it was a, a major focus uh, in, in terms of uh, government strategies, um, uh, targets, objectives, and how the budget f either follows or drives that, I think, was a major... You know, if you've had a briefing about the, the sessions we had last week, um, you know, and uh, 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 Christine McLaughlin's nodding, and, and she's often read that. And I think the committee would be interested uh, in uh, understanding better how the decision process is influenced by... Uh, by, by well, just how it is influenced uh, in, the, in this thing because it was uh, last week there was uh, um, we, there is no problem in gathering uh, statistics about any given thing in in the health service, but I think it was generally recognised as there's a plethora of th 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 these facts and figures that don't, as a consequence, inform the decision making pro process, and indeed the cloud and obstruct, in some ways, the transparency. So we're interested, if we're going to have an honest debate, to, to be looking at the factual situation, the challenges, and share those challenges, I think. I mean, can, I don't can, know whether can, you want to bring, I bring in Just before Christine. I bring in Christine, can yeah. I just say, uh, if you take something like health, year to year, a, a fair chunk of the budget's already bespoke because we have 24 a &E departments, we have 38 acute hospitals, we have a portfolio of community hospitals, mental health hospitals, GP practice and, practices and all the rest of it. So what you tend to look at are two things, I think. The additional money you're getting year to year, and as I say, this year we're getting, no, for next year we're getting 61 million on top of the Barnet consequentials. So where can we most effectively spend that money to achieve the government's health objectives and to fit in with our strategy? And we try to, to, to do that. And the second thing is, within the bespoke funding, there are possible changes you can make. Let me give you an example. Uh, initially, this started in Ayrshire and Arm. It's now being rolled out across the health service in Scotland. They have completely redesigned their orthopaedic provision. Uh, and provide what is they describe as an MSK service. Uh, as a result of that redesign, the need for operations went down by 25%. 25%. Now, that immediately frees up resource uh, in theatres and all over the place that can then be used for other things. So very clearly at health board level in particular, when that happens, they then make a decision. The resources that's freeing up, they then use to do something else that's appropriate. Um, and, and therefore, so you've got these two broad things. Where do you get new money every year? There's a very conscious decision made about the best way to spend that money based on what we're trying to achieve and f f where we know uh, well, we can have good impact. But also, in terms of the day-to-day -day work that's going on, continual improvement, redesign of services, when that frees up resource, um, then that resource, then the health board will, will reuse that resource elsewhere. It's like the efficiency savings. You know, unlike south of the border, the efficiency savings are recycled within the, each board uh, to improve service provision. And that's another example of where 
we um, change the use of resource uh, on a regular basis. But I'm going to get Christine to give you some more detail on that. We'll hopefully get a chance to speak about the, the other pressures on yes. boards and the political decisions yeah. that we're all party to uh, impact <laughs> on them. Hey, Christine? Yeah, so I guess that there's the spending review approach, which is looking at, you know, over the, over the three-year period. And as, as part of that, everything that ends up within the, that spending review will have been assessed. Um, and, and there's just a straightforward template, which is a bit more detailed than the impact assessment template, where we're looking at everything from um, whether it's a, a legislative requirement, whether it's, whether it's about um, supporting bill development, um, whether it's it's a key priority area for for the, the government in, in taking through um, uh, and the, the programs that are already in place and looking at whether it's right for them to continue um, and so there's an assessment against things such as the the um, support of the quality strategy um, there's an assessment against the um, impact on outcomes that are agreed so that that exercise takes place for the spending review and then it's refreshed each year as we do the the draft budget exercise. So, so there is an element of um, challenge and scrutiny on, on all of the lines um, that are in the, the, the documentation that you've got today, as well as the assessment about the, the level of um, uplift for boards, what's expected from boards to deliver within that, um, and decisions on things like the amount of money to go into additional NRAC funding. So, so each of those decisions are, are taken, um, not driven by the financial position, but at, at, um, how do we deliver the priorities for government as well as doing it in a way that's within the financial envelope um, and looking at the, the, the public value that is delivered from within it. Um, but we are looking to um, really strengthen that approach as well and look at a priority-based, a, a, a more fundamental priority-based review of um, particularly the spend within the, the directorates on the policy areas and what you see here in the, um, the level three and four detail and we'll be kicking that off shortly um, in preparation for um, look, looking at what's in 15-16 but also looking at 16-17 at, at as well. So, so there is a process in place. I think that we could still do more in terms of quantification of, of outcomes um, and there is work that Quest are doing to look to have a more consistent way in which we identify the outcomes that are being delivered by individual projects um, and a good example of that probably is in the child smile program um, and oral um, improvements generally there's, there's good evidence on the outcomes that are delivered and that's the kind of approach that we need to have across more of our program line so that we can have a, a, an assessment about public value so the transformational opportunities are limited to new money that's coming into the system rather than you know rather than the bulk of the finances that are already being spoken for? I think so. I think what we're saying is that we always need to be looking and we do look, um, that there's never an assumption that a, a spend will continue. What we look for is that, that there's a fit with the quality strategy um, and that there, or is there a legislative requirement that means that that spend has to continue. But there is no assumption when we enter the budget process that any any line item will, will continue. I think what... what um, Mr Neil was referring to was that in terms of the, the large proportion of the budget that goes to board baselines, then um, the, the decision there is, is mainly about what performance targets we expect from boards with that funding um, and, and what level of our total budget goes on a, an uplift to those boards. The, the model you've described for prioritising and um, uh, allocation, uh, whatever, is that, that model has been consistent uh, you know, over, over the period of time? Because I think the evidence that we have, I accept, and I'm sure other members accept, that what we're dealing with here is a decade-old problem. This is not the Cabinet Secretary's responsibility, uh, the, who happens to be sitting there this month or somebody else next month or whatever, whatever. Uh, you know, you so, well, the, you know, you know the, the dogs are barking, and, um, the, but but you, you've got a you've got a, um, a you know a, a you know a decade old problem here, when there w was uh, indeed uh, has been testified to a, a lot more money going into the system. Indeed, that it was difficult to exp to spend. And now we're in, I think, one of the evidence, some of the evidence we took last week, now we're in a situation where we're every, every uh, pound's counted on now. 
Um, you know, so if that mo you know if that model, how how is it adjusted over that decade period? Is it ha has it adjusted, or or has it just been that type of model that has looked to uh, deal with the immediate priorities and demands rather than uh, using it for the transformation? I think I think one of the very noticeable differences in the last couple of years has been that assumption that, that the status quo doesn't continue, that every line does need to be justified, and that it's not an assumption that it will just either flatline or increase, but that in some lines, as you'll see in the budget just now, that some lines there isn't the evidence to support it, or there's very clear feedback from those um, in receipt of that funding that that's not the best use of, of funds. So in those situations, we'll look to, to decrease or to, um, to take that funding away within a year. So, so we I'm do. No, I'm no expert on this at all, no, no knowledge on it at all, but it does seem pretty parochial. You look at the line when, when, how do we, how do we use the budget to transform the service that we currently provide? How do we continue to be world class? Isn't about looking at line by line, is it? Absolutely, and I think that's. Yes. How do we, how do we, we, start, we start with the big picture. I mean, obviously, the big picture decision we took. Uh, early on, uh, when the crash happened, uh, well, well, a couple of things. First of all, one of the decisions we took was pay restraint versus a policy of no compulsory redundancies. Uh, now that was a strategic decision. And once you've taken that strategic decision, then certain financial consequences follow. Another strategic decision we took was that in terms of the Scottish Consolidated Fund, we would pass on the Barnet Consequentials for Health. Now, obviously, that therefore has a knock-on effect on all the other budgets, because by definition, if you're passing on the Barnet Consequentials for Health, there isn't as much of the Barnet Consequentials uh, for the other services. So you start at that kind of strategic level, uh, but then, you know, when you get down to board level, uh, then they're they then have to decide within each board what their particular priorities are. I understand that, but I mean, I suppose what we're grappling with and what the evidence that we have, when that decision was taken, taken to ring fence, we don't disagree with that, that meant there was less money for local government to de deliver the transformation, to deliver more care in the community. And when the decision was made for no compulsory redundancy, that has an impact on patients in the system. Now, who made those decisions? This is, you know, man, in the full knowledge about the other impact. Uh, absolutely. I mean, right. obviously. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nanette. A couple of questions, separate ones for me. Um, to get back to the convener mentioned the AHPs, and uh, I mean, as the health service changes, the shape of changes, and they're more focused on community delivery of services and so on. I mean, the AHPs reckon, and I'm sure they're right, that there'll be more demand for their services, um, because every time something changes, it tends to put demand on there. Now, the, their contention is that um, a lot of these workforce developments elsewhere are funded, but as yet, there isn't funding for the increased expectations of AHPs. They have a significant concern about that. Uh, would you like to comment on that? No, we are talking to AHP, AHPs about that uh, particular subject. Uh, I think there's a, a difference between, um, say, a workforce development plan for nursing and a workforce development plan for allied health professionals because nursing is one profession. The allied health professions currently include 12 different professions. So obviously there are 12 different challenges, but um, we are in active discussion uh, because we do recognise, number one, that the role of allied health professionals is going to expand. Uh, and secondly, that we do need workforce development plans for every one of the allied health professionals, absolutely. I think the comment was, you know, the more health visitors you have, the more people are going to be referred yeah. to AHPs for, for Absolutely. Them. And also, I think uh, I referred earlier to how we need to, in future, deliver GP and primary care services. And I think that's another example uh, where allied health professionals will have a greater role um, and particular ones. I mean, uh, for example, if you look at Alaska, um, probably the impact when they redesigned the primary care GP services in Alaska, the biggest expansion was in the use of clinical psychologists. That was the single biggest expansion. 
So uh, I absolutely accept the point you're making, Nanette. <coughs> forward to developments on that because yeah. I think it was a significant concern that was raised. The other thing quite separate is the new medicines fund yeah. and clearly the 40 million for this year is is very welcome for that. Is that a one-off and if it's not how do you plan to, to manage it or you know, demand for it in future years you know as new more, more new medicines come on stream and um, you know what, what kind of rates of growth would you consider acceptable? Well we, we've announced that for the up to the period 2016, uh, and the reason for that is twofold. Number one is based on our best estimate, uh, and it's funded, as you know, by the PPRS revenue, and that's our best estimate of the PPRS revenue. Now, that's a completely new source of revenue, and it's still a bit of thumb in the air as to what it will be in three, four, five years' time. So I didn't think it was wise to announce something that I wasn't sure how much funding I would have beyond the next two years. And the second reason is, of course, we ourselves don't know our overall budget beyond 2016-17. Uh, and obviously the new government selected at Westminster next year will presumably undertake a new three-year spending review. So it will be probably at least this time next year before we know what funding is available to us beyond 2016-17. So I thought it was prudent to get uh, this money set aside using the PPRS revenue uh, for the new medicines fund, uh, but to announce the actual sum for the two-year period, I would see the need for a new medicines fund in principle as a more permanent feature of what we need to provide. Thanks, I mean, that's helpful because it kind of sets it in context, yes. because I really wasn't sure where it was going, and obviously you're not either. <laughs> not okay. money -wise, but I do think we will yeah, need, continue principle. to need... Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Richard Lyle, please. Thank you, Kindina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, one is the, the, the subjects you have actually not been asked, but it was touched on, I think, earlier on by Christine McLaughlin, was the factor of targets. But you did in one way say that you're looking for party consensus in regards to targets. You know, many governments make a target and the other party who's not in government attacks the target because you haven't either met it or you're, or you're failing to raise the, the target. Um, to my mind, the health board spending uh, in the health service can also be target-driven in, in the fact that if a health board does not meet its target on a particular issue, it will then reallocate that money in order to meet the target. Um, can you tell me how many targets presently we have in place? What is your opinion in regards to do we have too many targets in place or should we have more or should we, in the consensus you're looking for, between political parties discuss what targets there should be in place? Well, at the moment, if you look at the heat targets, which uh, are the kind of main targets uh, that we measure uh, in the health service, um, not the only ones, but the main ones, there are 12 heat targets, and most of those actually are to be achieved by March 2015, i.e. the end of the current financial year. So that's why I think we do need to look at where do we go from there, uh, in terms of targets. I mean, I think there are some of the targets which have driven real improvement in the health service in recent years. Uh, I think the treatment time guarantee uh, has driven improvement uh, and, you know, driven down waiting lists from six months, nine months, sometimes a year, a decade ago, to 12 weeks for most procedures now. Uh, OK, there are two boards that are not there yet, but we're, we're heading in that direction. Uh, similarly, I think the turnaround time in accident and emergency of four hours, every clinician I speak to says do not change that target because it is driven by clinical need and it's a very good indication for them, not just of performance, but of the standard of care that's being provided. But I do think some of the, the other targets, um, you know, the, there's room for a debate on targets and what, how do we measure success in the National Health Service. And when I said earlier about to depoliticise, you know, uh, for example, at the moment, we have a major challenge, as I said earlier, with delayed discharges, uh, because local authorities, rightly or wrongly, are finding it difficult to um, uh, provide social care assessments or to place people uh, in a timious way, and that's particularly over the last six months or so, has become a real problem. Now, that has a knock-on impact on our ability to meet the A&E target. 
Why does it have a knock-on impact? Because the beds that need to be freed up to accommodate people coming out of A&E are still filled up with people who are medically fit to be discharged but are, are not discharged and still in a hospital bed because the local authority isn't able to do the social care assessment or find them a residential place. So you have to look at this as a whole system approach. And there's no doubt at all that patient flow is absolutely key to the whole thing. Uh, because if you don't have the proper flow of patients, another example of the importance of patient flow is if uh, you're discharging, say, 10% or less of your patients each day, if they, of the total to be discharged each day, if 10% or less are being discharged by lunchtime, the chances are you'll find it difficult to accommodate the people coming from A&E. If that figure, instead of being 10%, is 40%, and you know I was in Cross House last week and they've got it up to 40% for most of their uh, wards, including orthopaedics, and the difference they've noticed in terms of the flow of patients from A&E into the wards is fantastic. Now, very often, the reason why there's such a small percentage of patients discharged before lunch is nothing to do with their medical condition. It's to do with the timing of the consultant's round. It's to do with the availability of pharmacy for the patient going home. It's the availability of transport for the patient going home. It's about coordination and management, actually, rather than medicine per se. So I think there's huge room for uh, us making real advances in these areas. Uh, and I think, in part, that is driven by the A&E target, which, as I say, clinicians tell me, every clinician I've ever asked a question to tells me, do not abandon the four-hour uh, four target for A&E turnaround, uh, because it is driving clinical excellence as well as um, performance per se. Uh, but as I say, there are some targets, including the ones that have to be met by the end of March next year. We have to decide, do we keep those going? Do we redefine them? Do we abandon them? Do the ones that we've achieved, do they become part of the lexicon and become officially standards rather than targets? So as I say, there's a debate to be had. And you know, I'm, I'm happy to have an open discussion about um, how we measure success in the national health and social care system. We also, I think, have to now take account of the nine strategic outcomes that have been agreed in terms of the integrated boards and what they have to achieve. Because clearly they need to be reconciled with and complementary to any targets that we set in the future. So there's a number of events demanding us to look at targets but my own personal view is that the key ones on cancer waiting times, on TTG and on A&E, for example, are, uh, my own view is we should keep those because they are, I think, a good measure of the quality of provision and not just the quantity of provision. Can, can I welcome your comments <coughs> and most of the comments you've made this morning and, and, and all the points you're making. Actually, I was in Wisher Hospital yesterday myself visiting a, a, a friend of the family and and basically, the, the point that this lady is uh, of the the, the um, elderly, um, you know, uh, uh, situation, and she, and she actually has went back into hospital uh, for a second time because of con condition, but she's waiting to get back out. And I welcome the comments you're making about, you know, that the, they look at uh, some stage where the people can come out of hospital and go into a, a, maybe a. a a care situation before they go to the house. I know you're trying to be innovative, very innovative, many things that you've done in, in, in the past uh, and uh, a couple of years that you've been the Cabinet Secretary. Um, but the, the one touchy subject that most people have come on to is in regards to PPP, PFI, uh, and how much that is costing. Uh, and I know you've answered many questions in the, in the Chamber in regards to this. Uh, is there any way out of this? Is there any uh, new information that we can look at and how to um, you know, recoup this cost or reduce the cost that's continually, uh, which could free up you know, millions of pounds? Uh, is there any further in regards to uh, that situation? We've actually got a team working under the Scottish Futures Trust looking at aspects of PFI contracts uh, because I wasn't satisfied that the individual boards were always monitoring these contracts because they're very hefty documents, to say the least and uh, as it were, getting as much value for money uh, as we could. We, we can't renege, we can't afford to buy them out because that would be a huge amount of money. I wish I could. Uh, but 
um, we've already realised some savings, particularly uh, one of the early projects was in relation to Forth Valley Hospital, and we've already realised savings, I think, of about £6 million over a period of two or three years uh, from Forth Valley. Now, I believe there's more to be done. Uh, if you look at the recent events at uh, Hair Myers Hospital, where the cleaning standards fell well below standard, and I don't expect the health board just to re-sign and renew the contract with Hair Myers without giving a very hard time to the PFI contractor. I believe they brought people up from Coventry to, to clean Hair Myers Hospital. And I find some of the behaviour of the PFI contractor in relation to Hair Myers is totally unacceptable. I think everybody around this table would find it totally unacceptable. And I expect NHS Alanisher to hold them to account. Uh, I would uh, anticipate that Christine uh, McLaughlin was going to say something. Yes, maybe course, I would wrong. Just going to give you the actual figures to answer your question. The, the total spend in um, in this current year, 2014-15, is £229 million on PFI and PPP. Um, and the, the work that Cabinet Secretary has just discussed in terms of that specialist team um, in the short time that they've been up and running have identified the, what, what would equate to £26 million in savings over the life of the, the couple of projects that they're looking at. So should should start to give some significant savings, given that these um, contracts are for um, long periods of time. That's two, can I, can I just say also, if you look at the detail of those figures, there are particular health boards, there are some health boards which have got a, a, a disproportionate problem. If you look, for example, at Lanarkshire, because both Wishaw and Hare Myers are PFI contracts, um, then the payments for Lanarkshire are of the order of £50 million. Pounds. I mean, Lanarkshire alone accounts for about 25% of all the PFI <laughs> payments every year in the National Health Service in Scotland. If you look at Lothian, Lothian's another board which has got a disproportionately high, mainly because of the Royal Infirmary, disproportionately high share of its costs going out in PFI. Obviously, Fourth Valley uh, has as well. There are some health boards that have got relatively few uh, PFI contracts, but um, clearly those boards that do have PFI contracts, it's an additional financial burden on them uh, in very difficult circumstances. Yeah, you actually just, <laughs> just said that what I was going to say, the fact that Lanarkshire, is a, a, as I say, being a central region, uh, list MSP for Lanarkshire, uh, you know, uh, Lanarkshire mainly comes into my area, and uh, it's quite a high proportion of what they have to pay out, and, uh, you know, they are exceptional, you know, Hair Myers at the end of the day, as I say, and, and Wisha are exceptional hospitals with exceptional staff in them, but they are costing uh, the people locally in, in, in Lanarkshire quite a high proportion. And uh, I welcome uh, the savings that you have identified under PPP. Um, I take it that these have quite a number, £229 million per, per year, uh, but they still have numbers of, you know, uh, numbers of years to, to run, uh, and is there any? There's no way we can uh, uh, convince these people. That, and you, as you say, the buyout would be tremendous. Well, it's not just the end of the contract. Actually, what has been signed for the end of the contract itself could be problematic, to say the least. So, because um, you know, you have to look at the legacy from the contract as well. So, uh, as I say, personally, I would never have signed these in a month of Sundays. Uh, quite frankly, I think the poor contracts, the Hare Myers one, the original contract particularly, was a disgrace. Um, but we are landed with them, and we have got to 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 deal with the consequences of that. But having said that, I'm not just lying down and saying, we'll just keep writing the checks. We have a dedicated team, and as Christine says, they've already identified significant savings over the lifetime of the projects, but they've only recently started. So I'm expecting more in terms of savings on these PFI contracts in the future, and I expect the boards to take a much more a robust approach to both monitoring them and when things go wrong, making sure that you know, these, these contractors are dealt with uh, in an appropriate manner and in a very robust manner as well. Thank you, Kinnear. Uh Colin, I'll, I'll take you back in, uh, Richard, yeah. Colin uh, Kea, please. Colin's agreeable, you can yeah, go on. No, if it's supplementary, yes. I was going on something else. Thanks, it's always... Cabinet Secretary, it's really difficult to get a grip of this PFI thing because of the commercial sensitivity that one never sees what the actual contracts are. But um, there are 
on the one hand, there's PFI, and then there's PPP, which was a bit better than PFI, and then there's NDP, which is claimed to be a better form of PF, the original PFI. They all include, to a greater or less extent, contracts on maintenance and contracts on cleaning and other things. Um, the other thing is, of course, that they, the, the maintenance side is important because the, the, the standard contracts, the public sector contracts, don't include maintenance. And there's a, the backlog in maintenance has been something that has slipped, according to the Audit Scotland report. There's real problems around 96 million is still high-risk maintenance. Uh, and some of that's capital we heard the other day, and some of that's revenue. So, you know, it, would it be possible at some point to get a, um, um, some sort of a, an independent analysis, I re even given the commercial sensitivity, to look at capital charges on the public sector buildings on the one hand, which are presumably low at the moment because interest rates are low, but can were six percent back in 2000 uh, capital charge versus NDP versus uh, PFI with all these bits actually spelt out as to what, you know, is different. Because otherwise we have no understanding going forward and our capital budget has been severely cut. That's the thing that's suffered most going forward. The amount we've got for public sector capital funding is really very tight um, in, in this budget. I mean, I th I, it's because of the nature of the contracts, a direct comparison may not be great, but I'm certainly, we will certainly look at it and see what we yeah. can... But, I mean, we, we, can, we can give you it, the, the information I got in front of me, which is about the unitary charges and on all of the um, locations and the length of the contract that's still left. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't think we can give you a like-for-like -like comparison because they do include different levels of, of service. So there isn't a straight um, comparison. And even the, um, the, the, the financing around each, each deal will be, will be different. But I mean, we can give you the broad brush differences between what we expect on NPD versus um, PFI and PPP, if that would be would, would be a helpful figure to have. And comparison uh, between the NDP and current public sector ch yeah, charges. I, I, can look at what I presume can the public you, sector charges, level. which are not in the budget, public sector charges yeah. on, on Southern General, for example, are they 6%, 4%? What are they going to be? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that and I'll set it out. If you take Southern General as an example, it might be a good way to let you see That'd comparable. Be helpful. Maybe be just take a, take a case study and, and work it through like that, if that would be... Helpful. That would be helpful. Thank you. Sorry. I, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's no doubt that the cheapest source of capital funding, if you're borrowing, the cheapest source of capital f funding, if you're borrowing, is the Public Works Loan Sport. And obviously, we will, in the next couple of years, have access to that. Yeah. Colin Keir. It's, uh, it's nice to see my first question has just been answered. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, actually, I'll blame Mr. Lyle here, if I've got to be honest. Um, the, uh, it's really in terms of the, the living wage and the policy regarding that. And I'm a bit just trying to get an idea of, uh, one, the effect, the difficulty of uh, producing the living wage within the National Health Service uh, in itself with the budgetary constraints. And that, what I'm unclear of is how does that compare with... Um, uh, the colleagues who are um, doing a similar job in uh, England, uh, you know, in terms of a comparison uh, uh, say with the living wage and who's got it, who doesn't, and um, really just a bit more information on the back of that. Yeah. Well, obviously, we pay everybody the living wage in the National Health Service in Scotland, and I think it's from the last figure, and I'm doing this from memory, so we'll check the figure and get back to you, uh, but I think I'm right in saying nearly 30% of all our employees are on the living wage, in the sense that that's, you know, they're at that end of the scale. Um, the, and I think I'm right in saying that south of the border, they do not have a national policy of paying the living wage in the health service. Uh, but again, we'll double-check that and come back to you. Uh, but I do, I would point out that, of course, the, as well as the living wage, the way we've applied the pay policy in Scotland has opened up a big difference between our approach and south of the border. Uh, for example, the DDR, the, the, both, both pay bodies, the DDRB, and the Agenda for Change pay body last year recommended a 1% increase. Uh, we paid the 1% increase. The UK government decided not to pay the 1% increase. We have kept progression payments. They're abolishing progression payments. They insisted on it being a two-year deal. 
we're making it as usual a one-year deal so they'll be reviewed again this year uh, and of course we'll get the policy of no compulsory redundancies so if you look at the pay differential if you take nurses for example um, the, the lowest grade nurse in Scotland is about £238 this year better off than her equivalent south of the border. A higher grade nurse will be nearly £1,000 uh, better off than her equivalent south of the border. Because ours is a one-year deal and you know I'm about to give evidence next week to the peer review body for next year, uh, but as I say, they're not doing that south of the border, they're making it a two-year deal. Um, so that, that gap's likely to increase next year. Now, I don't take any pleasure in saying that because I, I feel sorry for nurses and others uh, in the health service south of the border. But, uh, you know, we thought... I mean, when 1% is not a king's ransom in terms of the, the amount of increase, but I think it's the right thing to do uh, as part of a a pay constraint policy that allows us to keep a policy of no compulsory redundancy during these very constrained times. So I think we've got the balance right in difficult circumstances. Um, and the living wage is obviously a key part of that. And of course, within the pay policy, people this year uh, who are on um, £21,000 or less can get an increase of up to £300. Um, whereas if you're over that, it's 1%. Okay. Can, we, can we have... Um um, a global sum of what that costs the National Health Service because, you know, the the the, the leaked paper of uh, the, the, um, the the chief executives of sort of, of the health boards complain about all of all of this, uh, well-meaning uh, though it may be and agreeable uh, to us uh, politicians of all colours, I suppose. Uh, but we we. We know, I think, and it's been listed about what the pension will cost. Uh, we maybe don't know about what the ongoing 1% will cost. We don't know what the other measures of no compulsory redundancy will cost. Because, as we remember earlier, the Cabinet Secretary said, when we make these decisions as politicians, it means that there's an impact one way or the other on the service and its budget. And that's what the, the poor chief executives have been, have been saying in discussions with with uh, the Scottish Government, and, and, and as, as well as that, they also complain about uh, the treatment time guarantees, and I think we're all interested in that as a, as a committee, about how we move that forward, as Richard Lyle mentioned earlier. Uh, we, I think we've taken evidence that that, that that has a significant cost, and it would be, it'd be interesting to, um, uh, to understand we, what that does cost to get that other percentage or half a percent or whatever, because I think that gives it a perspective which would be important. But they also um, uh, worry about other political decisions like the 24-7 service provision uh, trauma network um, uh, that, that, um, that, uh, that, that costs them a lot of money within tightening budgets and maintaining hospital beds and nursing and staffing levels which is, uh, I presume, the no compulsory redundancy. So it's in that environment uh, that um, we look at a draft budget that gives them X amount of money, but, of course, the increasing demand, the increasing number of people who are presenting at A&E, the increasing elderly are there, so we're doing a lot of this to stand still, and the, and the political demands of, of government and uh, us politicians, uh, you know, and I, 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 if I got a chance before we finish, I'll come back on to the, um, the, 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 the costs of uh, drugs and new treatments that we focused on as well, which is, which is a significant amount which we played a part in. And, you know, so it's, it would be interesting to find out some of the costs associated with those decisions. Uh, um, um, in the light of the, the, the chief executive of the health boards complaining that, uh, of the impact. Two points, convener. First of all, the two biggest increases we will face next year as a result of the changes to employer contributions in the pension scheme as a result of the reforms being introduced south of the border. Now, we don't have a final figure on the cost of that, but we're talking about the order of £70 million, potentially. And, of course, there's also the um, national insurance changes uh, as well. Um, which will have uh, a significant impact. So, but we will, once we get confirmation of these figures, 
Yeah, the, the, tell you. The, the pensions impact um, that kicks in from 2015-16, boards have made a planning assumption of, of a 2% increase, and that's what's reflected in this yeah. paper. Um, we're expecting that um, final position in terms of the revaluation to be completed um, by, by the end of this month, the end of November, um, so there will be certainty about that cost. But, but we, we do anticipate it being in that region. Um, the the um, impact from losing the rebate on national insurance is, is more of a, a certain figure um, of 2%, of which is factored in to this paper as well, and that kicks in from 2016-17. So they are two very significant additional pressures which haven't been present in previous um, years for, for the boards. Yeah, I'm talking about all of these, you know, yep. the, the impact yep. of political decisions down south, and I think the chief executives uh, estimate that in 1617 is somewhere around 100 million, so there'll be a difference between 70 and 100 million pounds there for that. The national insurance decisions that this government make, you know, and, and, the, uh, and the reality that the costs of the health service are, are, are about the people who work in the health service. Yeah, so, you know, all of these decisions, all of these impacts that the chief executive can we have, um, you know, uh, you know, the global figure about no compulsory redundancy, the pensions, the the, the cost floor, the, the the living wage, uh, all, all of that, that the, the impact, and where is the mitigation in the draft budget for these items to allow people to deliver? And, and change the service. Yes, yeah. we'll provide you. You know, whenever we'll get the final figures, particularly in some of this stuff, we'll absolutely provide you with the detail. And uh, at the moment, as I say, we can give you some of that, but some of it has still to be finalised uh, in terms of the final estimate. We will provide that. Mm -hmm. Can I just make a, a point about the treatment time guarantee? I think it'd be a huge mistake if we just looked at this issue in a very narrow health provider point of view. Uh, if somebody is waiting, as was the case 10 years ago, say, um, for six months or nine months for an operation, and they're off their work for that time, the impact on the economy, let alone the impact on the family budget, is very substantial indeed. And therefore, I don't believe that we can just take in a view of this through a narrow prism, prism of being the health provider. We have to look what's right f for the Scottish economy. And I think if you're able to have people have their operations within 12 weeks instead of 12 months, the substantial difference that makes to the well-being of the overall economy is very substantial indeed. Now, I don't think everyone, anyone's actually ever done that exercise in recent times, but I just want to register that thought with the committee. Um, while I do recognise that if, by definition, if you improve the waiting time and, you know, 12 weeks is now the treatment time guarantee period, inevitably you have to invest in order to meet that target. But I think the Scottish economy, let alone the people leaving aside the patients, who are obviously the main beneficiary, I think the benefits to the economy in terms of not losing so much output and wealth creation and so on uh, are enormous. So I think, I think we always need to look at the wider picture. I, 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 think, I, th I was trying to get at that because what we had spoke about earlier was the tar targets in general uh, and indeed where there was a clinical demand for that uh, and fearful that the, the, the outcome would be poorer quality and we would all accept that. But we know when the, the waiting time targets fail, the political consequences, Lothian, the cost, the increased use of the private sector, money flowing out of, of the National Health Service. And I was just, I, I don't know whether there is a figure, but, you know, we've came a long way and many of us sitting around this table were inundated a decade ago about people who couldn't get an operation. Now that, that in my case, Lord, it happens very, very, it's disappeared. We touch wood and whatever, uh, you know, so, there's been tremendous gains there. And I, I would be interested, I'm sure the others would be interested to know, you know, about, you know, accepting that we have, we have come a long way. Much does it actually cost? Much is it diverting in terms of finance and resources where 
we could be creating that space to do something different with that money, whether it be, you know, transferring it into the community or whatever. I don't, I, I don't know, but surely uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, an area where we should have yeah. better understanding, not simply about the costs, but costs as part of that overall picture. Yeah, absolutely. And where we've got that information, we're happy to provide it to the committee okay. convener. Any other questions? Did, did I pick you up correctly when you said the £40 million you announced this morning is out of the £73.5 million? So it's not new money, it's, it's within it's that. It's part of that, yeah. Within that integrated care yeah. fund. So it's, it's a, that's just to get that clear on the record. The second uh, thing I have is that in the last budget, we had a specific figure for what you'd applied to NRAC. Can you, I, I won't ask you for it just now, but could you give us the indication, you know, rather than my having to table a question on it? <laughs> we could get the, well, easier just to send it to you. Easier just to ask you just now and ask you if you could yeah, uh, give yeah. us that. Um, th the third thing is uh, the issue of bed, bed blocking, which is clearly a vexed issue. I mean, yeah. we've come a long way since 3,000 bo block beds in yeah. 2003, since we began to tackle that program. But, you know, since 2008, when we reached the original six-week target of zero over six weeks, it's not really been sustained and it. Bits have improved, but the number of bed days, which is, I think, the target we should be moving to, mm. rather than this weeks, uh, because I think a two-week target is crazy, frankly. And I think it's just, you know, not possible. Some will be more. What will happen is many more will be transferred into, quotes complex, yeah. and therefore they'll be taken on to Code 9, and that's not what we want. We don't want gaming to occur in order to meet the targets. We've been through that once. So can I suggest that we should move to a better occupied bed days target? But the other, and the real question, convener, is given the problems you outlined of some people having stepped down, some people not, some people having adequate care home provision, some not, like Edinburgh, having real problems you know, with care home provision, how do you actually incentivize, how do you provide incentives, but also carrot and stick, so that, you know, in my area, for example, Clip Manager, SMP led, um, Sterling Labour led, have almost zero. Uh, delayed discharges. They've met the four-week target. They've done phenomenally well. But at the Falkirk end, they've clearly got serious problems, which impacts on my constituents uh, getting access to Fourth Valley Royal Lambert Hospital. So, you know, how do you actually get Falkirk sorted without saying, well, that's because you failed to spend money on this? You know, because if we give money to the people who have not performed, it's a, you know, you're, you're rewarding bad behaviour. I'm not saying Falkirk is bad behaviour because I don't know what their problem is, but they've got a problem. So, you know, how do you actually deal with this? I think there's broadly two, you could probably categorise the challenges uh, and the areas where there are challenges into two broad categories. You've got areas like Edinburgh and Aberdeen where this is a function of the local economy. Uh, and that uh, presents itself in a number of ways. Uh, in Edinburgh, for example, 25% of people in residential care are self-funders. And therefore, the attractiveness of local authority placements, which is about half the going rate for self-funders, is obviously a factor that is limiting the number of places available for local authorities to place people. Uh, and we need a strategic solution to that. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, Lothian is struggling to meet its A&E turnaround time, quite frankly. Um, and it's not because... If you, can I say this, convener? If you actually look at the turnaround time within A&E departments, according to the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, and take out the period when, after they've been treated, waiting for a, a bed, they are actually turned around very quickly. Uh, relatively speaking, it will actually within A and E, the bit that's adding on and causing them not to hit the target is the time they're waiting to be placed in a bed in a ward. Very often, and that's very often because the beds ain't there because of delayed discharges or because the daily discharge profile isn't good enough. These are the two main contributing factors. Uh, and uh, but in Edinburgh and in Aberdeen in particular, there are strategic issues. Uh, the care sector are finding it very difficult to get workers as well because the, the wages are low. And quite frankly, in Aberdeen, you get more money for filling shelves for a supermarket than what you do for working in a care home. 
we are working with COSLA because we recognise in our report, this is public, we recognise we're not paying enough for residential care, we recognise the need for the living wage throughout the social care sector, etc, etc, etc. And we're doing a similar exercise on home care at the present time because many of the issues are absolutely the same issues. So category one would be the likes of Edinburgh and Aberdeen where you've got a strategic problem and we need to have a strategic solution to that because we, you know, no matter how much we try, uh, uh, these are buoyant economies and the consequences of the buoyant economy are present real problems in terms of getting the people to deliver either residential care or home care. Then you've got the second category where I think it's an issue of um, management of funding, the lack of integration, the lack of a step-down facility and a whole range of other things. Th that category could probably be more easily solved and I, I will be expecting the strategic plans presented by the integration boards all to have very clear plans to deal with this problem. And where we've had integration for a long number of years, such as West Lothian, we don't have delayed discharges because the whole thing's joined up. And they do have also a step-down, step-up facility. And it's one of the reasons why they don't have <coughs> delayed discharges. The, so I, I can tell you now that um, the, the delayed discharge, the very significant increase in recent months, is going to have an impact, a negative impact in the A&E turnaround times, not because of poor performance in the A&E departments, it's because of the knock-on impact on the availability of beds and wards. I'm going to be absolutely upfront about that. Thank you. Music to the committee's ears about your discussions with COSLA and the living wage for care workers and indeed training and the quality of care. I mean, great stuff. Look forward to hearing all about that. Richard Lyle's coming back in. Supplementary, you know, Cabinet Secretary, as you know, I had extensive uh, years as a local authority councillor. I'll not mention how many years bore everybody. And a very, very good one, if I may yes, say. Yes, thank so. you very much, Cabinet Secretary. You do a good job too. Um, but basically, <laughs> the. <laughs> Basically, the, you know, can I agree? The, the point that happened in many local authorities is that they reduced their care homes yeah. uh, substantially. In, in my own authority, North Lancashire Stroke Motherwell District, uh, they closed a care home in my own ward yeah. numerous years ago, which uh, 20, 30 people were in. And, and also, and, and I, I, the point I'm trying to make is I totally agree with you that in order to get uh, people... Uh, who want to get out of hospital, they don't want to be there, you know, once they, they, they're, they're uh, well, uh, to get them into a situation where there is a, like a halfway house, step down, you know, step up, step down, you're using the, uh, the terminology. Uh, I totally agree. I, I'd be taking steps along with uh, 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 Derek Mackay and other uh, ministers and cabinet secretaries to look at how we can help uh, councils in order to... to get this situation, along with what's been brought in uh, in new legislation. I've well, made available additional £10 million in two tranches of £5 million to help with the immediate issue. Uh, but it's, you know, I'm not going to make that available every year. This is to deal with the immediate situation to help councils over what they perceive to be a particularly difficult period. But secondly, I do have a meeting this week with Mr Swinney and Mr Mackay precisely on this point, because clearly the social care budget is part of the local government settlement, and as well as the bilateral discussions we're having with individual councils to try and help them through the challenges they say they're uh, finding in, in dealing with this issue, uh, I'm talking to Mr Swinney and Mr Mackay about what else we can do as a government to try to significantly bring under control the delayed discharges issue um, because it really does have a substantial knock-on impact, particularly on the patients. If you are medically discharged, ready for medical discharge and you, your discharge is delayed for whatever reason, there is very clear clinical evidence that within a 72-hour period your condition starts to reverse and deteriorate and clearly that's the last thing we want to happen so it is i'm regarding this as one of my top immediate priorities to try to work with the local authorities to get this issue resolved I that. i'm sure that many local authorities will also welcome that statement thank you thank you very much indeed mutual appreciation as long as they know that i've got name money 
Well, yeah, we wish you well to get um, uh, get money out of Mr Mackay, Mr Swinney, anyway, because it's much needed in our communities. Um, Aileen, are you going to ask that climate change question or will I? Happy to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Um, final question then, um, Cabinet Secretary. The, um, the NHS board survey that was conducted by the committee found there was a range of examples of how NHS Scotland's sustainable development strategy had influenced the budget decisions. And the question really is to ask around, do the NHS boards need to be doing anything further to actually achieve the, uh, the climate change um, targets? Do there need to be any sort of coordinated action that's taken by the government? as regards to the health budget to achieve the climate change targets? Well, there is actually. Mike Baxter, who is Christine's colleague in the finance department, is leading this for the Scottish Government and is working with all the health boards, particularly on the energy front. Uh, the total energy bill for the National Health Service is of the order of £70 million pounds a year. And we would like to be able to reduce that, but not just because of the cost savings, but because we want more efficient use of energy throughout our estate. And if you look at the estate strategy that was published last year, and the update is due, I think, before Christmas, uh, one of the key sections is the, the initiatives we're taking in terms of improving our use of energy and extending the use of renewable energy resources within the National Health Service. And there are quite a number of examples of where we're doing that. And indeed, uh, where we can, we are keen to go be part of district heating systems and the like. So we won't just do it in isolation. We're doing it as part and parcel of the wider Scottish Government effort to improve energy efficiency and extend the use of renewable energy to replace fossil fuel energy. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Very Secretary. good question, very good answer. Yes. One final question in terms of the interest this of the committee. This is the third final question. This, this <laughs> is the third one. Just when you think you get to go. Um, we, we spent a, a, you know, a lot of time, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, with you on the, um, the funding of uh, new medicines and, the, the, and for uh, can't end of life and rare diseases. And uh, you announced, I think, um, 2013, 20 million pounds, um, and 15 and 16, 40 million pounds. Um, we know also, we play our part in this, we've created a, a pressure on the health service that one of the risk factors identified to, to us in previous evidence was the increasing drugs bill. Uh, and we know that, uh, I think, uh, uh, pharmacies and hospitals are increasing. That's increasing by around £10 million pounds per year. And the £40 million pound that we have uh, announced will be on top of that. How did you arrive at the £40 million pound figure? Do you see this as a one-off? Or do you see this accumulating over the next couple of years? You know, it's been suggested that it could be, you know, in, in 16, an 80, 80 million pounds because there will, you know, this will provide for X amount of patients the uh, new medicines, but there'll be new medicines coming on top of that. So how do you see this developing? Well, as I said to Danette Milne earlier when she asked me, I think more or less the same question, uh, the £40 million was our estimate of what would be required to fulfil the, the, the gap that the, the New Medicines Fund is designed to, to fill. Uh, I know we had some estimates to the committee from the SMC some time ago of £70 million. Pounds. Uh, as it turned out, our estimates are much nearer £40 million, uh, than £70 million. Uh, and it so happens that we're estimating something of the order of £40 million pounds of the PPRS money, which is new money coming to the Scottish Government under the uh, prescription uh, price uh, regulatory system. And we're using that money to fund the New Medicines Fund. Now, I, I think the New Medicines Fund will be a permanent feature of the National Health Service in Scotland. But the reason I've only announced this funding up until 2016 is that we do not know yet um, what the uh, funding will be that we'll be able to receive from the PPRS beyond 2016. And also, uh, as you know, we don't know what the overall Scottish Government budget will be beyond 2016-17. So I think the New Medicines Fund, I think, will be a permanent feature, but I cannot realistically set aside money until I get the information on how much money will be available beyond 2016. Yeah. But when, when the prescribing was identified as a risk factor at that point in time, 
uh, it was explained to us by government and others that that uh, PBRS scheme would be, you know, medicines coming off uh, license or whatever, however we describe that, would reduce the um, the, the 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 prescribing uh, uh, demand on the health service and and the health boards. Now. It won't clearly now because it's not going to the boards. The, 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 the reductions in what we pay for for, for those uh, prescribed medicines is not going into the health boards, and their uh, their, their budgets and hospital pharmacies are going up um, uh, by increasing by ten million pound a year on average. So the risk there still exists for the health boards about this increasing bill. Say two things. Beyond, before we actually set up this fund initially of £20 million, um, the, the bill for you know, some of these medicines that were made available as a result of the IPDR process, for example, were, were picked up by the board. So there'll be an element where what was previously picked up by boards a number of years ago is now picked up by the new medicines fund, although it's difficult at the moment to be precise about exactly how much of the £40 million will fall into that category. But the second thing, convener, is that we are engaging in looking at um, even greater control o over the prescriptions budget overall. The, the budgets bill is running at roughly £1.3 billion a year uh, for the National Health Service in Scotland. As you know, the Auditor-General produced a report a few months ago. She suggested with a number of changes we could save £26 million. I think from memory was a suggested figure a year. And we're working through the recommendations in that report, plus some ideas of our own, to try to get to a position where we get better control on uh, prescribing, on uh, at every level from that work. Exactly. They would retain that, exactly. that, that money. Absolutely. But you see you see the forty forty million pounds as something that the the fund sitting there which will not grow but will be capped effectively to twenty sixteen, is that um, well, at the moment, I don't uh, see. We, we think it, we, you know, will not go above forty million. Obviously, if there was a an unmet demand, we would need to decide how we would fund that. But we're fairly comfortable. But that setting aside that forty million will actually be enough to provide for the demand around it. Um, can I just say also? I mean, if I pick Fourth Valley, they did an exercise last year on improving the control of dispensing of statins. And as a result of that, just on statins alone, they reckon that in future are going to save six million pounds a year as a result of the new ways of the new methods of introduced. So I just pick that as an example. This is not something you know, I think there's potential quite a lot of potential still um, in savings on the drugs bill. Indeed, if every health board was as efficient at managing its drugs bill as the best, we would save tens of millions of pounds on the drugs bill every year. And that's that's really what we're trying to get to. Yeah, I, I'm just, just going to explain it. We've, we've done quite a lot of work to understand um, the scenarios around the, the costs of the new SMC process. Um, and, and it's not an absolute um, figure. It depends on your assumptions, obviously. That's why the figures we've got differ from the original estimates that, that you received. So the, the, the £40 million, um, it makes sense because that's also what we're anticipating in terms of receipts. Um, but it's also uh, um, what, what we believe to be a realistic estimate of the, the cost in this year. But they may be higher and they may be lower. Um, and, and we will look at that now that we've got the new process in place, particularly around um, resubmissions and what happens there. So we, we have quite a detailed process in place to identify the impact of the costs. We're geared up to get all the information from the boards on a regular basis so that quarterly we can report on actual costs um, against the new process. So uh, we, we can give you that. And similar workings for the, the £40 million pounds yeah, can that, be that's, to Yeah, that's the committee exactly. There. We'll be able to um, collect that information on a quarterly basis and see what the actual spend is. And that's really what will so allow us to look um, both into 15, 16 and see how realistic that is against the, the 40 million. But all of that money will then go out to the boards based on spend. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I don't think there is any other questions. Cabinet Secretary, um, Ms McLaughlin, thank you very much for being with us in the time you've Pleasure, with convener. Us thank you. Given. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, we'll suspend at this point. We are going to break. Hmm? To private now. Yeah, we're going into private. We agreed that, yeah.